Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture, and today I'm doing the show by myself. Uh, both Brian and Mayor were unavailable, so uh, I thought I would bring you an episode here today about uh, blockchain and humanitarianism. Uh, it's a topic that uh, we haven't really covered very much. I mean, a lot of the topics that we have on the show and, and projects we have on the show are usually startups or uh, you know, for-profit entities. Um, or you know protocol projects, but today we're actually going to be talking a lot about humanitarianism, how blockchain can help you help uh, in um, you know, humanitarian projects, and who better to have as a guest than our two guests today, Chris Fabian, who is a uh, lead at UNICEF Ventures and co-founded the uh, UNICEF Innovation Unit, and we'll get to talk a lot more to Chris about uh, UNICEF Ventures and the Innovation Unit and the work that UNICEF is doing in promoting blockchain technologies as a means to improve uh, humanitarian work. And Sean Conway, who is the founder of the IXO Foundation, and IXO is an organization that is promoting an operating system for data-driven impact, uh, especially in the humanitarian uh, space. So thank you very much for coming on, guys. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. So uh, as, as we often do with our guests, uh, we like to sort of get an introduction uh, and <coughs> learn about your background in the space. So perhaps starting with Chris, uh, tell us about your background and how you came into your current role at UNICEF. Uh, I came into it totally by accident. Um, I come from sort of the world of tech startups and, and making things at a really fast pace. Uh, and I somehow ended up in an austere 72 year old international bureaucracy. Um, but I think that the, a lot of the work that we work on in our team and that I did before was really about creating the space for new things that can fix really big problems. And uh, so before I was at UNICEF, I was in Tanzania um, and I had companies that looked at connectivity and access to information for profit. Um, and I didn't really know a lot about what UNICEF was, but uh, having now spent a few years in the organization, I think it's about eight now, uh, I found that we can actually have that same startup culture and that same approach to solving problems using the technologies that we're all interested in, uh, but do it at really a global scale. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about the specifics of the work we do later in the episode. So how do you, I mean, I guess we could talk about this later in the show, but like, how have you found trying to bring this sort of startup uh, culture into a 72 year old, uh, very large international, very political organization? I mean, I think it's a lot about resolving uh, two different kind of orders of magnitude of problem solving. So like startup world works really fast and works really aggressively and likes to smash things and international bureaucracies work really slowly at big scale and like to not smash anything at all. Um, and so a lot of what our team does is try to translate that. And we build a lot of prototypes. We build a lot of physical prototypes of things uh, which are actually software or data. We show those to people, we work with them um, and we work a lot with partners. So uh, partners of ours that are in the tech world can also show us uh, what's coming and I think we try to gently introduce those to an environment that is really not a risk accepting environment. Um, and we've had some successes and more failures, um, but it's, uh, it certainly gives us a scale of operation. UNICEF is five and a half billion dollars a year as an organization. It works in 195 countries and there are 12,000 people. Uh, that's 12,000 people who are nodes in our network now, who we use to find out about new things, to find out about hard problems um, and who become our partners in building stuff. And that's, that's a kind of really amazing scale to be at. And how did you become interested in blockchain technology? Uh, accidentally as well. A lot of stuff happens by accident. Um, we've got a great engineering team uh, in, in ventures. And uh, both Mike Fabrican and, and Kusai Jauda, who ha have been working with us on various software development projects, have been talking about blockchain and distributed ledger for a long time. Um, and then it's obviously like the dumb ones like me that just pick it up later. Um, we, we try to look at technologies for investments that are three to five years out um, in, in terms of kind of being out in production. So about two years ago, we did our first experiments with public blockchains and, uh, and they totally failed. And, and I'll tell you that story because that, that's a lot of fun. Um, but we, you know, we got a sense that this was something that was moving. And the way that our team evaluates potential areas of investment is by looking at industries that are at a $100 billion market cap 
and problems that can affect a billion people. So that's our sort of heuristic for, for what we look at. Uh, and, and, you know, is there something that's got a trajectory to that 100 billion? And of course, three years ago, 100 billion seemed like crazy as a, you know, a figure to talk about in the crypto space. Uh, it seems remarkably uncrazy now. So we found that like with drones, uh, like with data science, like with augmented reality, uh, this is very clearly a set of technologies that we want to learn about, work with, and invest in. Um, and we think that it can actually positively infect, affect and infect uh, the work that UNICEF does. Cool. And uh, Sean, uh, actually, so Sean and I met in Cancun uh, over lunch, uh, eating burritos and having margaritas. And he told me all about Ixo Foundation. And I thought it was a really fascinating project. And uh, actually, it was Sean who sort of connected me to Chris. And, and uh, you know, Sean, Sean will be uh, talking a little bit about the collaboration that they have with UNICEF. But we are going to have Sean on the show uh, a little bit later, and maybe in a few months or so, uh, to talk very much in depth about his project. But uh, so Sean, tell us a bit about yourself and, and your background in this space. Yeah, so I guess I've got a, um, a, a crazy path to here. I, I trained as a physician and I, I've worked for most of my career um, in international development and, and health. And I guess the real kickstart to that was um, around 20 years ago um, when, the, when the HIV AIDS epidemic was really showing its head um, here in South Africa. So I was a, a young physician um, working in the, in the government um, hospital services and was uh, given a project to look at some statistics. And uh, so with Excel spreadsheets, you know, uh, looked at, at the estimates of what the epidemic was gonna look like. And it was, was very clearly an exponential epidemic. And, um, and I got really um, charged up about this and thought, well, we need to do something. We need to do something that's gonna be an exponential response. Um, and for me, um, the use of data to drive all kinds of development initiatives, whether that's um, to, uh, uh, to influence market prices of medicines um, or to plan out um, um, you know, the, the, the demand for health workers um, or right down to a patient level, sort of tracking over a long period of time, uh, the clinical parameters that show whether you're having success or not um, in a treatment regimen. Um, that was really important to me. And so I got fascinated by the use of data within development. And so all of my career has really, really, really been about um, um, venturing on data-driven projects and data-driven um, ventures, uh, in, including some nonprofits and, and, uh, and, uh, and this, this latest um, uh, venture that, we, that we've uh, launched. So that's a good segue into Ixo Foundation. Uh, tell us about, about this, uh, this project and what are the goals here? Yeah. Um, so um, around four years back, um, I was uh, I'd actually taken a bit of a career break um, and uh, was lying on a hammock in Sri Lanka, of all things, and uh, uh, a great internet connection there, um, uh, 4G connection. And um, I was thinking about how to solve the problem of um, supply and demand within um, services that seem to always have an increasing demand um, and never enough supply. And the supply is usually driven institutionally. And we've been working on, on um, models of care delivery and, and uh, social support um, delivered through networks of community agents. And, and the real challenge there is, you know, how do you collect the data? How do you incentivize? How do you move information around these decentralized networks? How do you govern, govern the, um, the transfers of value uh, and, and the information? Um, and I was uh, I was lying there, um, you know, surfing the web, and saw um, uh, some articles about Bitcoin, and sort of had this eureka moment, and thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we could insert the information about um, the services that are being delivered into uh, into these transactions and transfer value and information, so information of value and value of information, um, and uh, and this would give us some proof of impact. We could bring together financial accounting and performance accounting. And so I thought this was going to be really easy. This is four years back. Um, we got the opportunity to, uh, to test this out in, in some proof of concepts in early childhood development. And Chris, I guess, will we'll explain the context of, of, of the UNICEF in, uh, investment into what we were doing. Um, and over the four years, we've realized that we have um, a, a core set of, of uh, standards and um, um, operating principles that we can draw on that have become um, standards for the uh, decentralized web, and I can I can talk about that in more detail. Um, so it's we've kind of stumbled upon a really exciting development in terms of uh, core standards at a protocol level that can be applied 
across all of um, the impact space. And it's really about taking data and turning that into, into assets um, that can be tokenized. So impact assets and uh, in, so impact tokens. And uh, I can talk about that a bit later. Absolutely. That sounds really fascinating. I mean, of course, one of the great benefits of blockchain is having some sort of traceability you know, coming back to sort of an, an initial event. And if you can, like, yeah. if you can, if you can trace sort of source of funding to uh, an impact, right, of like how we spend that money and the impact and the result of how you spend that money, then you, you sort of build a reputation system there uh, where, for instance, say like a sort of humanitarian organization then uh, has like, you know, proper reputation and credibility about how they're spending their funds and the actual impact on the ground rather than just, you know, how much money they're raising or like how many people they're reaching or, you know, some, some sort of data, you know, results that don't really have a whole lot of meaning. Yeah. So, so in, in, in this um, development space, uh, the catchphrases are accountability and transparency. And there've been a number of initiatives over um, certainly the last decade, um, really pushing accountability and transparency. Um, and, and so certainly blockchain technologies provide for this, um, but they also provide for, um, for, for more than that. There's the opportunity we see to create a new form of capital, a new form of economy, um, the impact economy, which values um, uh, the impacts that are being delivered um, through organizations that are, uh, that are making a difference in the world. You know? And so when we start to count what matters and value what counts, um, we can we can generate new forms of economy, you know. So as we all know, you know, Bitcoin sort of came from nothing, and now it's a hugely valuable part of of the economy. Um, now, why can't we start to value uh, impacts that are relevant to our sustainability and to our well-being as society? That would be very valuable, uh, indeed. Um, so uh, you know, we'll, we'll come we'll come back to uh, to Ixo towards uh, towards the end of the show. Um, to talk about so your collaboration with uh, with UNICEF. Um, so uh, back to Chris. Um, most people are familiar with UNICEF. I mean, most people have seen the little orange boxes, uh, you know, next to cash registers and uh, convenience stores or just at retail stores. And like growing up in Canada, I remember seeing like UNICEF commercials on TV. And um, of course, like it brings up all these, you know, really positive um things of like helping kids and and in the developing world but uh you know remind our listeners you know like what is unicef um as an organization like it is part of the un so maybe talk about that and also what are the goals of that organization sure so it's an interesting and complex place and then i sort of learn more about unicef every year that i'm there i actually didn't know a lot about unicef uh when i joined and so i came from this kind of world of fast-paced stuff and i i guess i had the same recollections you did like something about kids and it was like a pretty nice organization it wasn't mean like unicef didn't do mean things um what i've learned over the last few years is, is that it actually does a lot more than just not doing mean things um unicef is the world's largest humanitarian organization for children. And when it when the organization focuses on kids, it really focuses on the most vulnerable. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of our team work in our jobs. So almost all of us come from the tech world, uh, but there's a clear mandate in the organization to fight against bullies. And bullies can be physical bullies or system bullies, things that make the world unfair. And by most vulnerable, uh, we quantify that by looking at bottom quintile of people economically, but there are many, many types of vulnerability. So economic vulnerability is only one. And so this is an organization that literally fights for the kids that are that are left behind that other people don't fight for. And I think that's really nice. Uh, that's something that we can all kind of get behind. and We all feel good waking up with that as the mandate. Specifically, UNICEF uh, works with governments in 195 countries to create the right policies in governments that are that, that make sure that kids are included, but also to, to take action. So we respond to emergencies. UNICEF responded to over 350 emergencies last year. Um, and that's about $2 billion of emergency supplies. And that means getting things to communities faster than anybody else, getting the right things there and making sure that communities can rebuild. Um, so our team was in Liberia during the Ebola crisis, which was the most scary, I think one of the most scary things I've ever done, um, working with communities there to make sure that information could flow, that kids could get information about hand washing, that we could know when schools were being closed and so on. Um, and, and that's, that's the on the ground part of what UNICEF does. The other thing that UNICEF does is at a system level, make sure that the right policies are in place for uh, inclusion, for making sure that kids with different or disabilities kind of are able to be in a common uh, space for learning and opportunity and choice. Uh, and we also buy a lot of stuff. Uh, UNICEF is the world's largest single purchaser of pencils. 
fun fact, um, but we also buy 34% of the world's vaccines. And that's important. When you buy that much stuff, that's a billion dollars a year of vaccines, more than a billion. Uh, when you buy that much stuff, you have the ability to move markets. And this I had no idea about when I joined UNICEF uh, at all. And what that means is you can sit together with the big pharma companies and make sure that there's fair, open, and transparent pricing on vaccines. That's incredibly important. Um, so all of those three levels, the sort of programmatic work, doing stuff, uh, the sort of policy work and the, the financial work come together and make a very nice environment for a team like ours, which looks at new technology. And you can imagine that, uh, you know, we try to turn the gears of UNICEF's education or health systems strengthening and, and turn them faster uh, and, and by using those three levels. So making sure that we're building products on the ground with, with users, making sure we're working with governments so the right policies are in place uh, to take those technologies, and then working with big companies uh, to make sure they understand that there's a market even in parts of the world that they might not consider their main, their main kind of market. I, I like this idea of like UNICEF fighting bullies wherever they wherever they appear, whether they be you know, corrupt governments or corporations or um, illness or mal malnutrition, those are all the all of the bullies that UNICEF goes out and tries to fight against by implementing policy and like getting people to change their minds about certain ways and things, ways of thinking, et cetera. Um, so you mentioned that you worked in, in Liberia. What are some of the most impactful things you think that UNICEF is doing today um, you know, aside from obviously like delivering uh, vaccines to you know people with illnesses that might end up killing them, uh, or delivering pencils to kids that need them in schools. Yeah, so I think that um, structurally, UNICEF is is looking at the biggest weaknesses in systems. So the reason that I mean, people are poor because systems are unfair, and. And when you're poor, you don't have the ability to go to a good school. You don't have the ability to have action and to have an opportunity and choice vector in front of you. You're kind of left behind. So I think the most important thing that UNICEF does is ensure that every kid, uh, try to ensure that every kid, try really hard to ensure that every kid has equal access to opportunity and choice. And I'll give you an example. Um, if you're, so there are 55 million people who are children, 55 million young people who are on the move because of war or violence. That's, you know, uh, inconceivable number. I, there's no way to make 55 million make sense to anybody. So 55 million kids who don't have access to the things that many of us take for granted, uh, a health system, a school, um, an identity. And so the type of work that UNICEF does with refugees is make sure that that five-year-old refugee kid has some semblance of normalcy, that they can go to a school, that they can be around other kids. Um, and it's not only to be nice, it's also really important to society. When you have imbalance, when there is unfairness and inequity and inequality, societies come apart. And you can see this in the world today. You see the strains of inequality everywhere. Um, and, and this is how a dialogue that could be very condensed and connected has become very polarized. And so I think when UNICEF works with refugee populations, for example, we not only make sure that there are systems to give kids health care and vaccines, uh, but also that those kids, once they get the right nutrition and the right education, have some access to opportunity, have some idea of how to be part of the world. Uh, and that sounds very lofty, but I think it's, it's, it's really important. When we were in Liberia during Ebola, um, there were these, there's a group of 14, 15 year olds who were in the most hard hit part of Monrovia. Uh, there's a, a peninsula in the city that had been really cut off um, and quarantined. And we met them after, we got there in November, I think the end of October. We met these young people who were literally going door to door with notepads and asking questions of households in their neighborhood and telling information that was important to other young people, to adults saying, you know, don't, don't wash dead people and things like that. We worked with them to build a system and I can talk about it a little bit more, but we worked with, we were like, okay, so you guys are the heroes of the Ebola outbreak. You are literally in the most difficult place. These, it was 45 degrees. It was muddy. They were walking around with, with, with boots, you know, rubber boots on and these pa pads of paper. And we worked with them to build up a system that, so that they could use their phones to SMS in that information more quickly. I don't think that there was any genius in that. We literally looked at people who had a brilliant idea, but maybe not all the access to networks and things that, that we do, and helped them build something that made their job better, that made them uh, create more balance in the world around them. Interesting. So, so there have been some... So I guess the innovation unit then has produced some some projects that have been valuable uh, and have, have have had positive outcome. Um, I'd like to ask you then, sort of, 
you've been with UNICEF for a number of years now and sort of been in the humanitarian space. Do, do you think that the world is, is tending towards uh, less inequality? Like, so like, you know, if you were to look at like results of the actions um, sort of impact that UNICEF had, 15, 20 years ago and the impact that it's having now and sort of the result of that. Do you, do you see that we're moving towards an, uh, an improved situation or uh, is it staying the same? Is it, is it, is it degrading? I'm going to go with Jack Ma on this one and say that the next 30 years looks really bad for humanity. Um, I, I think that you, you see aggregate gains. So UNICEF was started as the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund after World War II. Uh, my mother still has a blanket that my parents, my mom was a refugee. Um, she still has a blanket from the version of UNICEF that existed then. Um, that was, the organization was founded to respond particularly to children who were displaced after World War II. And the E, the emergency, was taken out of the name about 20 years later, because it's like this should be for all children. I think we see an aggregate good change in the world. Like, on aggregate, things are getting better. But the divide between those 55 million refugee kids and us who have houses and infrastructure is growing greater. And that really worries me. Um, you have a country like Malawi. We've, we've just opened the, the largest humanitarian drone testing corridor in the world in Malawi. It's 6,500 square kilometers, 400 meter vertical, incredible opportunity uh, for young Malawian engineers and techies to work on drones. But Malawi has 18 million people uh, more than half of them are under 25 years old, and the major economic hope for them is a coal factory that's being built. So I, I really worry about that inequality, about the inequity that we see in front of us, about the fact that uh, the, the technologies that are coming into currency in, the, in wealthier countries or wealthier parts of wealthier countries are built on disparity. The training sets we're using for modeling and, and are, are, are not fair. The genomic samples that we're using for building medicines are not fair. They're not equitably sourced from, from all of humanity. Uh, and that creates an inequity that doesn't necessarily appear at global statistics. Like there are fewer big wars now, sure. Um, but that really shows itself acutely in the places where there's the most weakness, the most system weakness. And uh, our team tries to address a lot of those things. Sorry, I know that's a, a more bleak answer than uh, maybe one would expect. Hey, you, you tell the truth <laughs> how you see it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I do sort of agree with you that, you know, as an aggregate, you know, we see less wars and like less massive extinctions of, you know, human population as we did maybe like a uh, hundred years ago or even more recently than that. But that uh, we do see growing inequalities amongst, uh, you know, the, the most privileged people and those that are the least privileged. And I think that that's something that we should all, um, that that's a gap that we should all try to narrow. And I think that one of the ways that one, one of the tools for that, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, blockchain technologies, and we'll, we'll talk about how um, that can be applied. Uh, so moving to the more like the technology side, um, how much of UNICEF's resources and um, like the, the mandate of UNICEF uh, generally, how much of that goes into developing new technologies for humanitarian reasons? So a lot of, I mean, UNICEF is a big five, it's a five and a half billion dollar organization. Uh, most of our money goes into kind of core work. Um, and for us, core is delivering services to the most vulnerable children. We don't, we try really hard not to fetishize technology or to, uh, you know, make technology be the goal in itself. And so we don't have a huge budget and our team has not ever wanted a huge budget. I think we, we do a lot by being uh, kind of lean and aggressive and, and small and hungry. Um, and so if you look at sort of how UNICEF invests in technologies, we are a, I mean, our, our regular resources, the funding that we took from core UNICEF last year was like, you know, less than a million dollars, a tiny. And all the rest of the money that we use, we raise uh, through our venture fund and through other mechanisms. Um, but we, we invest in these early, very high risk areas. And as they develop, as they become more sure, UNICEF puts its organizational muscle behind them. And an example of that is the work that we did with, with um, SMS as a, basically as a command line for international development. Um, so over the last eight years, we've piloted, prototyped, and built systems for using a text message to send like 
very important information about health systems. How many vaccines are left in a health center? How many kids are in school on a given day? And to do that all on a basic Nokia 1100, you know, like a phone that has nothing else that can stay charged for days, weeks. Um, and so we basically built this operating system for international development that allowed us to do our job better, but also allowed us to connect with people like these kids in Liberia uh, and hear from them in real time. And we put, you know, a bit of our investment into that. We put a lot of our time into it. That's now an organizational priority. That system called Rapid Pro is a platform with more than four and a half million active users. It's in 35 countries, 39 countries maybe now. Um, and that's a platform that's a, an open source, cloud-based enterprise, SMS, and other information moving system. Um, and that's something that is a core UNICEF priority. So now there are millions of dollars being invested in getting that into government, scaling that up, working with new partners, uh, and it's taken a life of its own. So I think that's what we try to do is really create those early prototypes, build them to a point where they have some gas behind them, and then get them out the door. Um, the muscle of UNICEF takes it from there. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of us who are used to the fast paced uh, sort of world of, of startups and, and you know, failing and crushing it and all of that kind of nonsense. Um, it's one of the reasons that a lot of us are in UNICEF because we can actually see the extension of our work. You can see when something's good, how it, how it goes big. Did you just make an Ethereum pun there? I did. Projects with gas behind them? <laughs> yeah, that, that was, that was I, I've got about like four of those and uh, I'll reuse them. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, okay, so I mean, let's let's uh, dive into blockchains then, uh, and uh, and sort of the intersection between UNICEF and blockchains. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you, you know, given just how, what the space looks like right now, um, you know, there's been a, a massive interest in in blockchain and, and you know, uh, public blockchains, especially in cryptocurrency, in the last uh, in the last you know three years, but most notably in the in the last few months. Um, how, and, and, all, and of course there is, uh, all the sort of permissioned, uh, and more private blockchain systems that we are seeing slowly, but surely come into production and in, in more of the enterprise space. Um, how does UNICEF sort of evaluate, evaluate, uh, the different technologies and the different types of networks that exist in the blockchain space today? So we, we take the same approach to blockchain technology as we do to any of these other sort of areas where you have a large market force behind a technology and the potential to solve big needs. So other areas that we look at in, a, in analogous ways are drones and UAVs, uh, data science and machine learning. So these are areas that are all kind of buzz, buzzwordy and buzzworthy that uh, some people really believe in. Some people think that they're going to solve everything. Drones will be delivering everything. Uh, some people think they're totally useless or scary or dangerous. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of people in between. So anytime we have a technology space and blockchain is one of them, uh, we try to principles. Uh, and these are the UNICEF principles of innovation. They're online that we created them after many, many failures. And they just make us, we don't fail less, but we fail in less stupid ways. Um, and these principles are things like design with the user or be open source or, you know, be data driven in your development. So they're, they're pretty basic, but they, they're a rubric that we use when we're looking at a new tech space. And so in the blockchain space, uh, I think there is a lot of hype and I think there is a lot of potential. And I think actually CryptoKitties showed us that we're at a space where you know, meet, you see the network inefficiencies and you see where things can go, right? So we wanna be careful of what we promise, but we also wanna be sure that we're taking advantage of new things and making the world more efficient. There, there are three ways that we, looked at, we look at um, sort of public permissionless blockchains and distributed ledgers. The, the first is that we, there's clearly a road for fundraising and for, for transactions coming into organizations that are doing good. Now, we've seen this with the Red Cross. They're already using digital currency, accepting uh, donations in uh, ETH and in Bitcoin. Um, we have, we've seen this now that like yesterday, the Pineapple Fund launched. So that's $83 million of Bitcoins, like 5,000 Bitcoins. Um, that are available for charities and nonprofits. So there's something that's happening in terms of resources and resource allocation. And if I were putting uh, digital assets into a, in a, you know, an investment to fix the world, I would want the transparency and the accountability that public blockchains bring. I would rather have that than just give a dollar and hope that it gets to somebody. Um, so I think that we see an, an opportunity for a different type of engagement with people who want to fix the world. And we've had really nice notes. We've got a, a public 
uh, Ethereum wallet and people have been just dropping little bits of Ether in there. Um, and we got a, a really nice note from somebody, just random guy. And he's like, listen, I, I put in like, I don't know, it, was like, it wasn't very much then, but we're happy with it. It was like 0 0.1 Ether, right? He's like, I did this. He's like, I just want to be part of something that's, that's fixing the world. I just, I like this feeling. Here's, you know, here's something. I think we need to understand that better. I think there's a lot that we can do to reshape the way that funding streams work and development financing works. And that's very exciting and it's very kind of macro. The second level that we look at is internal and it's about reducing the friction inside of a big bureaucracy. Um, how do we make sure that when we're paying a, a, a vendor or we're, we're moving money to a government or we're moving money across offices that we have transparency, accountability and speed? Um, how do we, UNICEF is a complex organization, but we are represented by contracts. How do we make sure that our contracts are also represented publicly and intelligently? Um, and we're, so we're testing out in our office in Kazakhstan, we just did a hackathon on smart contracts for bureaucracy, where we brought about 200 uh, kind of crypto folks together and we're like, here's an insane UNICEF contract, represent that, you know, I don't know, in solidity or like go do something with it. And they're like, wow, that really is an insane contract. Um, if we can start to describe those things publicly, we can bring them into the global view and we can optimize them. And then the last area that we look at is direct investments into early stage companies. So like the company that we invested in uh, that Sean ran in South Africa, um, companies that are using crypto technologies or blockchain technologies to try to fix something. And we have a small venture fund that allows us to make directed $100,000 investments of capital, uh, non-dilutional capital into these kind of companies that are really trying to solve acute problems with distributed ledger. And that for us is creating a portfolio of opportunity. Uh, those are high risk investments for us. Our investors know that, um, but that's where we also get to see things in action, things failing and changing and turning and twisting. Uh, and that's the venture part of our work. Okay, so if, if I just recap then, so there's sort of three levels of how you evaluate this technology. The first being looking at sort of public networks and so sort of the applications that we are starting to see emerge there, one of which of course being funding. And in your case, the, the, so the benefit there is having the sort of transparency. You mentioned having a multi-sig wallet so people can donate funds and like there's a sort of a, an audit trail there of like, what funds are being donated, everybody can see it. And then potentially at some point in there, you can sort of plug in another system where you would have like proof of uh, proof of impact or something like that, right? Like that's publicly visible and sort of made available to everyone for, for everyone to audit. The second would be sort of improving, uh, streamlining internal processes and procedures within the organization. This is, a tough, this is sort of an area that I'm very much uh, interested in because my company does this for enterprise. So like, you know, uh, uh, I like this idea, right, of being able to streamline through sort of more consortium blockchains uh, and being able to automate a certain number of things within an organization. And the third then would be um, sort of investing in innovative technologies and um, identifying opportunities through the venture arm. Um, so if we, if if we, because we we are going to talk to Sean uh, uh, about about his project and and touch more about the venture arm in a few minutes, but uh, coming back to the the two first layers, so public blockchains and the uh, consortium networks. I've, I've had this idea, you know, running around my head for quite some time now, a couple of years. And, um, you know, I, I think that it would be interesting to consider as a thought experiment, um, a sort of public consortium blockchain that would be run by nonprofit organizations um, for the purpose uh, of improving transparency and accountability within all those organizations. So take like UNICEF and like Doctors Without Borders and like Red Cross and, you know, just take like the, the top 100 humanitarian nonprofit organizations in the world and have them be validating nodes for something like a Tendermint blockchain and have that platform uh, be the basis upon which you can then build all types of applications. So one of them could be like funding, right? We want to have transparent, traceable accountability in funding. And we want to have a system upon which we can do that, that scales at a high level um, where, you know, like we, we, it runs globally, uh, it's compliant uh, across the world. Right. And like, we can build this on this platform and then take another application. I don't know, like uh, voting governance, um, you know, who are the board members of these organizations? How do we elect um, people on the ground, like uh, local offices and things like that? Is, is this something that, you know, is conceivable today? Like, because 
I feel like, at least for now, for the next couple of years, public blockchain infrastructure, such as Ethereum, is not going to scale. I think Vlad Zamfir just put a tweet yesterday actually saying that like nothing's in production, nothing's close to being in production. And deploying a consortium blockchain within an organization sort of is limiting to that organization when there can be just so much more that can be done. Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? It is uh, not only possible, but there, I think, are notional um, artifacts now that show that it's, it's probable and likely. Uh, so I think that there's a lot to be, to, you know, if you look at like fractional reserve development, so not everything uh, needs to be on public blockchains. And I think one of the things that Sean did in the early days of our investment with Trust Lab was actually look a lot at a kind of dual or, or you know, multi, multi blockchain projects. Um, we believe, I, I think what we're seeing from our experimentation and our investments is that we can create a network and we can use UNICEF's trust to validate parts of that network. And we have enough uh, corporate partners and other development partners that would also be interested in being part of such a network uh, that could do a bunch of things. So I, I think the answer is yes. I agree that that's a, a useful and necessary and possible thing. And I would go even further and say that, you know, within that network, which could be joint public and private, um, you could also use public blockchains to start using transaction records to create soft identities for people. You could start bringing in some of the uh, large amount of, of sort of charitable or you know human investment money that I mentioned earlier into that system. You could validate that, and you could probably back that network you know fractionally with something like Ether. So, uh, I think it's a very interesting idea to explore, and um, it's a conversation that's a type of conversation we're having with a lot of our partners, and we would be happy to hear from others who are interested in being in that space. Cool. So you mentioned this experimentation you did with uh, with Ethereum, Ethereum smart contract multi-sig wallet, uh, and there was a blog post that we'll be linking to in the show notes. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this experimentation? Like, what are the goals and what did you learn? Sure. Um, so this was under the uh, the part of our you know the part of our job where we're like, let's just try this and really hope that we don't break anything too much. Um, this was when we were, and this is you know considering Ether not as a currency but just as a digital token. We wanted to see if we could, as a large international organization, accept tokens from others and do things with those tokens. That was the premise of our work. Um, we had a contact, and uh, the crypto world is amazing and incredible. We had a contact from somebody uh, in, in Switzerland who said that he was auctioning off some, uh, some posters and that he would like to send us some Ether from the auction. Uh, we needed a way to be transparent about accepting those non-currency uh, non-valued tokens into UNICEF. So we created a, a, a nice kind of multi-sig setup um, with me and, and my co fund co-founder, Sunita and Kusai, um, linking it to our UNICEF identities, which are publicly available and attributable. And, uh, and we created uh, the smart contract to actually accept donations from this uh, auction and actually helped him build his side of, of the smart contract as well. And we set it up. Um, I think we got, you know, two ether out of that. Um, and it was really interesting. It, it showed that we could do something. It showed that we could set up an Ethereum node on UNICEF architecture, like that was nice. Um, it showed that we could have a transparent way of receiving tokens, uh, not funds, because to receive funds, we have to have our lawyers clear things, and that's definitely not what we were doing. Um, but also that we could uh, do that in a way that was public and described and start to get public support from the crypto ecosystem. So it did a bunch of things. It, it let us play around, but it also uh, started creating a buzz with the networks that we like, uh, that we were doing something new. And so that, uh, that wallet is still up. Um, it's transitioned from being an experiment to actually being discussions inside of UNICEF on what it would look like on how you would create an asset class for cryptocurrency, if that was a donation, where you would put those assets, how you would value them and so on. Um, so it's really been that prototype of the future that we like to build. And hopefully it's provoked enough discussion that it serves its value. Um, we haven't moved any of that ether out yet. So that's something that we're going to be doing over the next few months uh, is looking at like, what do we do with those digital tokens that are certainly not money um, and how we, how we use them in a way that shows uh, what a future of transparent investments of non-monetary things uh, could look like. That's interesting that you say that they're not money um, because I mean, like in most jurisdictions, I think governments would consider, I, mean, I know that in the U S for instance, you know, crypt cryptocurrencies are considered a form of currency. Is this, is this? I was speaking of my naive view at the time that we set this contract up of how a digital token was valued. 
and that I certainly, our team never went into it thinking that there was a financial implication behind it. Okay, I, I understand. Okay, and it looks like you've got like two point seven one seven ether now, and yeah. other tokens uh, like data coin, for instance. You've got five cents of those. How many people keep spreading things around, right? <laughs> That's the fun of an ICO. Um, is what I want to know. Uh, uh, okay, and so I'd like to bring the discussion, uh, take take a step back a little bit, and, and talk about um, talk about sort of blockchain adoption. Um, and so, as a as a as a technology evangelist, I think uh, I, I would qualify you as promoting blockchain within the UN. Can you give us some insight about you know what response this has gotten? Um, you know, how do people respond to this idea? People are responding well. I think that you know the future is a scary place, so we try to evangelize with a sense of possibility and then also a sense of looming fear, uh, and that's how we try to bring products into into the limelight. Um, Kusai is our blockchain lead. He is an incredible evangelist of the technology and has presented uh, our work much better than I do at fora like the World Bank. So he presented to sort of senior World Bank uh, leadership at uh, the State Department, at various UN venues and at universities. And we've, what, what I think we've seen from his presentations and the networks that we're building is that there is uh, a sense of opportunity, a desire for direction uh, an interest in following the principles that we've set up and an ability to do some quick rapid prototyping in various organizations inside of the UN. Um, I think that one of the things we're trying to be very careful of is making sure that we keep the direction towards public permissionless blockchains as much as possible. Um, and that's really, that's really to keep lined up with our principles, which are very firmly rooted in the open source tradition, but also to make sure that we don't put ourselves in a position which we were in in the mobile and SMS space in 2009, where we had one company who owned a lot of our infrastructure or owned a lot of our data. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we're creating that uh, internal sense of possibility, but also keeping the market open um, so that as different protocols develop on different blockchains, we're able to be flexible and we're not locked into any one vision of the future. Um, there are other organizations that are doing um, prototypes and tests of blockchain. We work together through the UN Innovation Network, which we co-chair with, with the World Food Program. And that brings together nerds from across the agencies uh, to sort of share what we're doing. And, um, and so that's kind of publicly documented. I think we'll be putting out our, um, our most recent report on like what's the state of blockchain in the UN in a few weeks. I just saw a draft yesterday. Great. Uh, can you expand on some of these experimentations? Is that something you can talk about at this time? Sure. Um, I can speak to our own failures better than anybody else's. Uh, we, so we started looking at using the Bitcoin blockchain as a way of holding identity uh, in the transaction, kind of hashing up an image and, and holding that uh, as a person's identity. That was like two years ago. That was very expensive even then. And that was also our uh, fumbling around with the concept of big online databases. So that didn't work, but we did some experiments with that. And that, you know, there's a lot of talk about like, oh, blockchain means identity. And it's like, you know, as we all know, it doesn't mean identity explicitly. It can mean identity if a certain set of conditions are met. Um, so we, but we tried with this very explicit identity, like let's hold an identity on the Bitcoin blockchain. That didn't, that was interesting, but didn't work. Um, we played around with the smart contract. We've seen that WFP is doing some things with private Ethereum nodes um, for refugees in uh, the Middle East for kind of payments and a payment system there. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of interest in the smart contract side of things. So as I mentioned, our office in Kazakhstan is trying to describe some of its very difficult and, uh, and, and complicated contractual stuff uh, in a way that could be publicly accessed. So those are the, those are the sort of the initial pointers that we see. And uh, we're trying to document them and just learn from them. And those are all on unicefstories.org slash blockchain um, as much as we, you know, as much as we can capture them. And when, when you present these use cases and these, these experimentations internally, um, what kind of reaction are you getting from, you know, people that have been, so I, I, I would say like, in the um, the more conservative uh, side of an organization like the UN or UNICEF. I mean, we've presented drones, you know, like as a way, oh, you could move health supplies with drones and, and had people say like, don't do that, drones kill people. I mean, so we're very used to this reaction. We tried, when we tried to bring SMS as like a data platform in 2009 or eight, we were like, don't use SMS. This is what we were told, don't use SMS, use VHF radios, they're much better for moving data. So we're sort of used to the resistance of, uh, 
you know, of a, of, a, of a way of doing things against the future. I think that the decomplicating the technology is important, explaining that this is not really that new in a sense, like databases, distributed databases have existed for a long time, and making very clear use cases of how this technology can be applied to ongoing work are, are the three important things. Like, if you say, do you want to use a distributed ledger to make your job better, I think people will kind of throw up their hands at that. If you say, I've taken the contract that you use for paying your partner uh, in, in the government and I've put it in a way that makes it faster and cheaper for you to do it, here's how much it cost you before. It used to cost this much for a transaction because of all the paperwork and the people and then and now it costs you one tenth of that. Here it is. Then they're like, wow, okay, I get that and I see how that can be applied operationally. So um, that's the process we follow with any technology, like make it useful to the user, build it in a concrete way, get rid of the jargon and the flash and be boring, like be super boring. A contract is a boring thing. That's great. Like I like being boring. And, uh, and so I think that that gets uh, more of a transaction happening, sets of transactions happening in the organizational lymphatic system, the more boring and simple you are. I would definitely echo that sentiment. Um, to anyone who's explaining any of the technology to anybody who's typically wearing a suit, um, you know, try not to geek out about it. <laughs> just, just be boring about it. And don't yeah. mention IOTA. Don't, don't talk about the tangle. Don't don't mention IOTA. And 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 definitely, yeah. If you can if you can show some sort of return on investment or show how this technology will make their job better or uh, uh, reduce sort of operational frictions or reduce paperwork or the time it takes to do a certain thing. That's definitely a direction you want to take, uh, and uh, but but it is hard to find to find those sort of those those key metrics that you can point to uh, because of just the state of where we're at right now, where a lot of this stuff is still experimental. We're not experimenting with like real data. Uh, there are a lot of like parts of the stack that are still not you know quite there yet in order to bring things to production. So. You know, I think slowly it's getting to a point where we can say, oh, we've experimented and like we've been able to show that we, re we reduce costs by X amount, but um, it's, it's, it's taking a while to get that wheel turning. But I think once it's- But I mean, like if, you know, if kitties brought the whole thing down, if like 12 kitties per second brought the whole thing crashing down for a little bit, that's, that should tell us how humble we have to be. You know? And I think it's totally fine to design for the future and our, we try to do that a lot, but I think we need to be very explicit about that. Like, we're creating a runway for the organization to be more efficient. It may not be this year, it may not be in the next 18 months, but at some point these small experimentations and the investments we put into them will pay off. And I think we have to, you know, you can create, uh, you can value future options in finance, so you can do that. So I think if we consider uh, blockchain like we consider artificial intelligence, which doesn't, that means less than blockchain to me, but you know, those types of fields as potential future options, uh, we can then be in a better position to talk about them because we don't have to prove something right now. We can say, this is the process of experimentation we're going through. This is our hypothesis. This is what we think will happen. And, and this is the runway of time that we expect to see results in. But I do think that the, um, you know, some of the very basic organizational descriptions that you can do uh, through a smart contract will be immediately interesting to the people in suits. Like, that's a nice thing. They like to see systems described. And, uh, and I, I think that's where we're going to see the first real impact inside of the organization, which is awesome. And our finance people are incredibly interested in this space. And it's great to be able to have discussions with people who know a lot more about money uh, than I do, where they're really part of the, of the building process. And I hadn't seen that with like the SMS technology. We didn't, we didn't have that kind of alliance inside. Yeah, it, it is bringing together all of the different uh, I guess like business units of, of an organization. Um, that that's, that's what's so interesting but also you know, presents a big challenge with this technology is that it, it doesn't only impact like this one little corner of your organization it's going to impact your entire organization and the way your organization interacts in the broader ecosystem and i think that's uh, that's a sort of paradigm shift that and, and an idea that is as massive if not more i think even more massive than you know the idea of taking your you know paper card database and putting it onto an, a computer system you know, which people had to, you know, juggle that thought like 25, 30 years ago. So, uh, but before we move on to the, to the venture arm, should you just talk about the, uh, so the, the, the strategy for the next, you know, 12, uh, 12 months uh, and beyond sort of what is the, sort of the long-term goals here in terms of, 
um, how the UN and UNICEF uh, is uh, will, will be approaching sort of blockchain and implementing them in 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 projects um, that have cool. direct impact. Our timeline is pretty clearly aligned with the three levels that I described. So we have a um, we have a set of sort of external funding accepting of cryptocurrency discussions that we are having now. We believe that those will option out, um, you know, in the next six months that we'll have some answers from accounts and financing about how we can deal with cryptocurrency. That's at that top level. At the business process level, um, we did a, a hackathon in Kazakhstan that was amazing. We're going to do another one in the end of the first quarter of this year with another UNICEF country office where we're going to bring the, some of the Kazakhstan stuff to another region and be like, this is the smart contract that we described. Here's how it could work. Let's try it in another office. Uh, so we should have some internal momentum around that uh, stuff by the end of quarter one. And then we have investments. So we've got an arm uh, of, of our team that does direct capital investments in companies. Uh, and we have a call out for blockchain related companies now. Um, that is a call for companies that want uh, 50 to $100,000 of, of capital investment. Um, and that's described on, on our website as well. And we hope that we'll be funding five to six companies uh, in the coming months. That call closes at the end of January. It usually takes us six weeks to eight weeks to make our funding decisions. Um, so we'd see those coming into play end of quarter two, probably realistically. So those are the three uh, levels that we're working on, as well as some you know secret stuff that we don't want to pull the curtain back on too far. Okay. So that's a, that's a good segue into uh, our, our next topic, which is the the venture arm. Uh, I was I was actually surprised to hear that the UN had like proper like venture funds to invest in startups. But I guess it's like any organization, uh, you need to have that uh, sort of spark of innovation that, that comes from a from a, a very agile organization startup. So can you uh, sort of talk about the types of companies you're investing in and what are you looking for in the startups that you're investing in? So the uh, fund is a relatively new vehicle. Sunita Grota and I co-founded it about two years ago. Um, it, it's based on you know, our ideas of what, what's best from the VC world, which is like itself a very dodgy place sometimes, um, and what's best from the world of development. And what we tried to do is create a hybrid model where we went to our LPs and investors and we pitched them on an idea of, of creating value out of open source intellectual property. So we said, look, what if we don't want to hold on book assets for UNICEF? What if we want to create portfolios of technology that's curated, that goes back to our LPs, uh, that has a worth? And if we could invest in five companies around data science in five countries that are interesting, you know, would that $500,000 investment potentially be worth more than $500,000? Um, our initial investors said that that was a reasonable hypothesis. Uh, they provided us with $12.5 million of initial investment money from four anchor investors. Um, and we've made our first seven or so, 10 investments now uh, into private companies. The fund only invests in companies that are registered in the countries that UNICEF works in, which is interesting. So that's the 135 companies that we, uh, countries that we consider program countries. Uh, so that's not the, not US, not Europe. Um, we only invest in companies that are registered as for profit. So we don't do nonprofit uh, kind of investments. And we look at companies that have the potential for growth in their technology space. We combine a set of companies. So um, Sean is currently alone in the, in the blockchain portfolio, but we're going to find some other investments to connect them with soon. But in the space of drones or data science, we try to, to bring groups of companies together, give them the technical support from our team and from our partners. Uh, that they need and and help them grow faster by being open source and working together in these spaces. Uh, our investments actually get us a lot more than you'd think. Um, $100,000 capital investment in Burundi is, is quite a substantial uh, investment to make. Um, and we find that these companies can then grow to a second round of investment uh, to graduation into acquisition and so on. Um, and we're going to be seeing the first of those things happen in the next six months. We also invest in some of the platforms that support this work. So as I mentioned, we've got the largest drone testing corridor in the world for humanitarian purposes. That's an investment uh, through the fund that is its own asset class that supports uh, the individual investments we make in drone companies. So if you're the drone company we invested in in Kenya, you can come and use our corridor for free and that can accelerate your work. Um, so the, the fund does those two things. We are looking at and exploring how we could have a, a, a crypto denominated fund that would work along the same lines. 
that is pending uh, all of the review of the people that need to say that it's okay to do that and it will break the system. But we, we feel very positively about that as a possibility. Um, and we're also looking at another stage, a second round of the fund, which is shaped a little bit differently. But, uh, but in general, the investments that we've made cluster around these kind of emerging technologies that have a $100 billion market cap behind them or more, and that can address fundamental human needs, uh, though not with an explicit social good focus. It's just that the company has to be good. Like they have to have good DNA. So it's not a, it's not a social impact fund in that sense. Oh, that, that, that's very clear. And so how big is this fund? It's 12.6 million. We've put out about 5 million of that. And is it, is it funded? Uh, where, where is the capital coming from? Is it coming from UNICEF donations or are you have external funders? Nothing that uh, we do comes from the core UNICEF donations. So, uh, this is from four LPs. There are four anchor investors who came in, two governments uh, and two foundations. They all have expressed sort of slightly different interest in the valuation of the IP. So some of the governments are interested in using the procedures or the companies that we work with in their own internal arms. The foundations have similar, similarly divergent interests. We were very lucky to have Sean and his team present at our first LPs meeting in New York a few months ago and show the progress that they'd made. And we had really good comments. Uh, from the people who've invested in our fund that show that the types of technologies we're investing in are actually pertinent to their work. So, you know, this is exciting for the investors because they see something that they maybe aren't able to play with exactly at the speed that we are. Great. So I guess this is a good segue then into, uh, into a section of the show with, with Sean and Sean has received investment from, uh, from the UNICEF venture fund, at least one of the projects Sean was working on previously did. And so, Sean, can you tell us about that experience and how working with the UNICEF has benefited your um, your work? Uh, and we can also talk about that uh, about uh, the EXO Foundation and uh, this idea of proof of impact. So, I, th I think we're all familiar with um, you know the, the general approach in in, in blockchain um, solutions that you need to start off with some proof of concepts. And so we were um, provided with some innovation funding um, from, uh, from an innovation fund here in South Africa to do a proof of, in, of, uh, of uh, concept um, in the context of early childhood development, solving a real world problem, um, which is how um, uh, non-governmental uh, service providers who are delivering uh, preschool services to children, around about 800,000 children in the country, um, make their claims for a daily attendance subsidy, which is paid by the government. Um, now, that's a boring problem. It's uh, you know making claims um, and getting paid for them. Uh, the the problem that has been identified there is lack of trust in the system, a lack of um, uh, administrative uh, efficiency, um, and uh, a lot of gaps and and lack of information around where the needs are and um, where the money is going. And so we were approached to. Um, uh, to provide a use case implementation, a sort of test of uh, using blockchain um, for this very sort of practical real world uh, problem. And, and so we built a solution um, for that, uh, which is uh, a product called Ampli. And, uh, and we thought that would take, you know, six, six months to a, a year to, to kind of prove out and, uh, and scale up. Um, well, four years later, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons and, um, uh, we have a, we have now scaled that and 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 we have uh, um, more than fifty thousand attendances recorded and we're now going into into a sort of more production mode. Um, but along the way, you know, we needed to uh, establish new kinds of partnerships to take this beyond one use case and one local implementation into the global uh, potential that this has. Um, and Chris has spoken about establishing platforms. And, and I think this is a really important concept, um, you know, with an, an, an important uh, possibility within um, the blockchain or sort of if we, the broader sort of uh, set of technologies, if we don't go beyond just distributed ledger, and we also talk about um, the um, new web standards for the decentralized web um, and uh, new data technologies, um, including machine learning and so on. All of these disruptive technologies are coming together in ways in which we can we can have a really transformative um, effect on um, how information is collected, um, how it's how it's valued, how it's exchanged, um, and therefore the kinds of economy that we can we can uh, enable um, through the use of information. Um, so that's really where we've kind of migrated with the support from UNICEF um, from a local implementation 
on a very specific use case to a global potential and to understanding that we can we can take this fundamentally open source um, philosophy and uh, standards that align with what's happening within um, the standard setting processes around the decentralized web and take them into a protocol that becomes a platform. And so that's where the EXO Foundation um, has, has uh, kind of taken the custodianship of this uh, open source project um, and is, is uh, seeking to, um, uh, to expand the, uh, the, the use cases of, of this and the implementation of this across a broad set of uh, uses with, it, with um, a growing network of partners. So what do you see as the future here for so the EXO Foundation and the work that you're doing with UNICEF? Uh, I, I mean, I suppose and, and I hope that, that, that this work and this platform will then benefit organizations like UNICEF that raise funds and that, you know, want to build reputation around proof, like some kind of proof that their, that their work is providing some kind of an impact. Um, yeah, so so the the next phase is really being able to um, uh, to systematize this. And and Chris has spoken about um, you know how once uh, technologies are are proven, um, UNICEF has the the reach and the scale through its country offices and through its partnerships with other organizations to be able to to take things to scale. And I think that that's the really critical thing for us now, you know, so it's been great doing the learning, developing the the, the tech and so on. But how do we how do we go to the next level and um, get adoption of these technologies uh, in ways that it can actually impact on um, on many, many people's lives. Um, now, we can't do that ourselves. And we, we you know we're not interested in, 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 in going and implementing um, the, uh, the, the um, um, the solutions in, in, in all different contexts. What we want to support is the platform that enables other people to build on that. Um, so the, the analogy, I guess, is um, in the way in which the Ethereum network and, and Ethereum smart contracts enable um, you know, uh, an open ecosystem to, uh, to exist, um, creating applications on a core protocol and a core set of, of capabilities around compute and data storage and so on. Interesting. Well, I uh, I def I do hope that uh, that you have a lot of great success in building this platform. That we see all kinds of applications being built uh, that are like providing a lot of value to people who really need it. And so I, I believe it's just sort of starting as a project, and you plan on launching this network. What's the roadmap here? Yeah. So um. So so the the first step has been to formalize um, um the open source project. You know. So in the same way as 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 we have a kind of model around open source um, foundations like the Linux Foundation, Mozilla Foundation, Web three consortium, and so on. Um. We felt that the next step is is to establish this um, open source uh, code base within an open um, uh, community uh, um, and a, a, a foundation uh, model, and to bring in. Uh, key partners. And so UNICEF is one of the partners. We have Singularity University Ventures. We have the Gold Standard Foundation and a number of other um, organizations that have an interest in, um, in, uh, in, in applying the protocol into use cases through their networks. And so we, we, we focused mostly on organizations being um, um, uh, participants in the network um, that have got their own networks. And, and that creates, of course, much bigger network effects. Um, and across the different organizations that um, that have uh, um, have expressed an interest or have actually formed, um, there's a number of very interesting use cases, um, carbon, uh, carbon credits arising out of uh, clean burning cookstoves and linking health credits to that um, um, from the, um, uh, the health uh, prevention um, benefits of clean burning uh, cookstoves and, and heating. Um, across to impact bonds for education, you know, for young women in, in India or um, early childhood development impact bonds in, in South Africa. And so we have a whole range of use cases which will provide us with um, further proof of the, uh, the utility of this um, protocol, but also add to the, um, the, the, uh, the software um, uh, with reference implementations and, uh, and a growing data set um, around, uh, around sustainable development initiatives. Fantastic. That's uh, fascinating. And so we'll, we'll, we're going to have you back on uh, in, in, I guess, a few months. So uh, to, to 
talk more in depth about uh, or at length about uh, about Ixo and the protocol, and we can get into the technical aspects of uh, of Ixo. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you very much to the both of you for coming on today. It was a fascinating discussion, and uh, I look forward to seeing. You know the the uh, I, I guess I'm uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna channel uh, Rice Lindmark here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this, you know, humanist blockchain future um, where humanitarian work uh, can be sort of improved uh, by by this technology, and where uh, you know organizations like UNICEF can be more accountable, uh, and where we can you know, have actual proofs of the impact that organizations are providing on the ground for like you know, kids in this in this in this uh in this case so uh good job to, to both of you for um working on such a noble cause and thank you for coming on thanks for having us thanks sebastian so thank you to our listeners for once again tuning in uh this show and lots of other great shows about blockchain and bitcoin and all these great technologies can be found at letsnotbitcoin.com. Uh, if you like the show, there's multiple ways you can support us. One of those ways you can leave us an iTunes review. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to see your reviews. And you can also leave us a tip. Uh, we accept tips in Bitcoin, Ether, and now in Bitcoin Cash. And the tipping addresses will be in the show description. So thanks so much, and I look forward to being back next week.